welcome to Slash Forward. I hate to say it, but this video is going to get moist as we slide on our swim wings and go splashing around with Dagon while trying to maintain our sanity. We'll also be exploring whether Paul and Barbara will catch on to the dangers surrounding them before being forced to share their blood and reproductive organs in service of the Eldritch God that brings the fishing village of Imboka perpetual prosperity. This, of course, begs the question, if they're pulling golden trinkets out of the ocean like it's candy. Why are they living like this? We're going to figure out what's up with this movie, starting with the rundown of the core storyline and its presentation of the Dagon mythos. Let's get to it. We open in shallow waters where an underwater explorer carefully approaches a mysterious hole and submerges into its murky depths. He notes the curious detail forged from precious metals and so lifelike. Ah, the mythological mermaid come to life and hungry. This is revealed to be a dream, but not just any dream. It's the moist recurring nightmare of Paul Marsh. Barbara believes he suffers due to being all wound up and she suggests he try to relax. After all, where's the pleasure in having your research trip funded by a wealthy benefactor if it doesn't involve your GF asking your D? I don't find any of this enjoyable. You are going to regret that for a while. Or he would if he wasn't so obsessed with chasing that bag and spending every free moment checking the returns on his stock portfolio. This is a total turnoff for Barb, who is inspired to spontaneity. Oh no, the stocks! They argue about the value of aesthetics while the wealthy venture capitalists who funded this excursion, Howard and Vicky, look on amused. They all pause to take in the soulful droning tone that seems to be emanating from the nearby fishing village. But then the winds pick up and they can barely even begin moving things below deck before the ominous clouds threaten to swallow them whole. Howard only summered in the Hamptons once when he was 13, so they hastily lift anchor and he promptly thrusts some rocks into the belly of the ship, which penetrate the hole and pin Vicky between the boat and the whole earth. She's really wedged in there and the prognosis for her leg isn't good. Since the radio is not working, Paul attempts to signal the shore for help. The shore, however, is completely devoid of man or beast. It's determined they'll have to travel to the dock via raft. Hoping to reclaim his captain's credentials, Howard elects to hang back with his wife in case he has to go down with the ship. Out in open water, the raft is bumped by something and almost immediately springs a leak. While back in the ship, Vicky claims to feel something in the water, other than the debris, we presume. But they can't see through the oily top coat, so Howard plays it safe and shoots blindly when things start churning. Paul and Barbara are shocked the boat situation devolved into a gunfight so quickly, but are too committed at this point to turn back. Once they reach the dock, they awkwardly run up it. They find the town to be full of beautiful stonework, but no apparent occupants. As they approach the church seeking sanctuary, its symbol is reminiscent of the one Paul sees in his dream. When they knock, the droning sound stops immediately. This implies people inside, but they find no one. Just some statues of the elder gods and one person. The father is eager to demonstrate his charitability and follows them to the dock to assess the situation. He enlists the help with a pale seaman to undergo this rescue mission, but no girls allowed. Boys only for these rough and ready sailors. Barbara instead agrees to hang back and give the necessary information to the police. Being inexperienced, Paul immediately fish hooks himself, which they teach you how to avoid on day one of boating school. He then waves farewell to his gal. When she discovers there's no tower coverage here, the father invites her up to a working phone in a way that reveals a cheeky little congenital mutation. Along the way, the townsfolk are now out and about, although it would be preferable if they were not, because they are universally creepy. At the hotel, the proprietor is both unable to fulfill her request for a telephone or provide a positive customer service experience. The padre then arrives to administer help, but not in her favor. Meanwhile, the boys are able to hook onto the schooner and climb aboard. Paul ventures down to the living quarters but finds no one living, or otherwise. The cabin is strangely empty other than Vicky's marital towel. When he gets back to the dock, we learn that he presumes them dead rather than pleasure swimming, and he's told Barbara wanted to meet him at the hotel. When he arrives, he receives a similar blank stare. He finds evidence that Barbara had been there, so he decides to wait for her return. Only through great effort is he able to express his desire for a room with an hourly rate. Paul makes his way up and eventually finds an unlocked door he assumes to be his room. He is pleasantly surprised to find it has a view and is completely soggy. 
The power has also been turned off for his safety, which is a thoughtful touch. After confirming washing up would just make him dirtier, and finding that he can't reach the front desk for a long overdue turndown service, he picks the least moldy seat he can find and slumps down for a rest. He's shortly awoken by a visit from Barbara, but upon closer inspection discovers this to be the fishy mistress of his dreams. When he actually wakes up, he discovers that the villagers are getting a little restless, and they don't like being stared at. With the pounding of their approaching footsteps, he attempts to lock himself in, but in order to do so, he has to whip out his trusty Victrinox to perform a speedy screw job, getting the latch at least minimally attached before arrival. This gives him just enough time to bust into the adjacent room, and with no other options, he's forced to go out the window and hope for the best. He winds up in their tannery, where they fulfill the town's needs for any skin-based products. Through a hole, he sees those froggy little freaks pointing him out to a mysterious man in the town's only automobile. He tucks himself away in the shadows as they fumble around in search of him, speaking some sort of ancient dead language. Paul finds Howard mercifully freed from the burden of being constrained by flesh, and his yelp gives away his location. Thinking quickly, he's able to escape after setting fire to a barrel of formaldehyde and sneaking out amid the din and confusion. He then stealthily retreats through the back alleys, taking a grizzled old longshoreman hostage to avoid him alerting the mob. They keep quiet while a legless citizen scoots on by. Paul then compels his captive to keep silent under threat of mildly cutting him, unfolding the long blade of his knife so it's clear he means business. He inquires into the whereabouts of the others, and old Slippery Joe here confirms they're dead. He totally personally saw two women get killed. It was crazy, but also expected as no one ever leaves this shit town. When Paul wonders why this is, Ezekiel thanks him for his interest and offers to tell him true about the secrets of Mboka. It starts when he was a boy, a simpler time when kids played stickball and helped their fathers with the mud harvest. With the sea exhausted and never having heard of hamburgers, they pray for more fish, but were forsaken by the God of Abraham. Then a strange swarthy man visited them and promised a bountiful fishery harvest, so long as they agreed to worship Dagon, god of the seas. But the devout village cast this helpful stranger out for blaspheming. He performed his ritual anyway, because he likes being a hotshot, and cast his line deep into the bosom of the ocean and drew from it the eldritch god Dagon. Any hesitancy by the village is washed away when they start pulling fish and golden artifacts out of the sea like it's their job, which it is. With their newfound wealth, they say bye-bye to the old idols and initiate a non-peaceful transition of spiritual authority. They end up with much more stylish ritualistic costumes, but with the downside that prosperity requires sacrifice and your boy's daddy was first on the chopping block. Dagon is a hungry bitch, so all choice of worship is rescinded and his mother was made a bride of Dagon, and forced to take on all the responsibilities that entails. And Paul's not totally buying it, but Ezekiel swears on his bottle of hooch it's true. The plan now is to find the black car to use it as a vessel for escape. Unfortunately, it belongs to Xavier Cambaro, the town big shot who is a well-protected man of limited mobility, as are most of the sons and daughters of Dagon. After consideration, Paul elects to trust his crusty new friend. Ezekiel repays this by wandering out and providing a distraction for the guards. Once clear, Paul creeps over to the car and carefully snuggles up to the velvety upholstery. He begins to work his magic, except he's never actually hot-wired a car before, and this is the wiring for the horn. This forces him to very rudely exhibit to his pursuers how advantageous legs can be for running. He slips away to the first unlocked room he finds, which is occupied by the woman of his dreams with the crazy eyes. Despite their only recent acquaintance, she lies for him to confound his pursuers so she has some quiet time to stare longingly into his face, and also taste him a little. Yushi is aware of the dreams and reveals that she has been eagerly awaiting his arrival. After only a few moments of passionate kissing, Paul dives right in, deblousing her and diddling her gill flaps. Wait, gill flaps? He rips back the duvet to reveal her to be a tentacled mermaid. Recognizing copulation would involve manually fertilizing an exterior clutch of eggs, he runs off into the night to pursue a different destiny. Oh, grow up, that's the dream. On the way out, he makes the important discovery that fishmen got nards. He then takes the chauffeur's keys and uses his phone as though it were a small rock, which also allows him access to the car. He gets her started and whips out of there. However, they did not spring for the defrost option, so he finds himself 
himself, driving through a crowd and getting his wheels jammed up to the axle in fish guts. He's very nearly caught here until he's able to put his lucky hubcap to good use. Afterward, he gets a lead on them and ducks into a nearby house. He mucks around in the brackish water and his pursuers wander around in vain. But as he's waiting for the coast to clear, a pasty young boy sounds the alarm, and when he manhandles him, discovers his daddy to be a very robust, betentacled man. He takes Paul to Thunderdome and submerges his face in what is the equivalent of a gas station toilet. Luckily, Paul's shoulders are double-jointed, allowing him to leverage the tank lid to get him off. He thinks he's in the clear, but runs out to the street where he suffers turnabout, when it is he who is caught up in a huge net. He wakes up in Barbara's lap and kisses her with his fishy toilet water mouth. After soaking her in for a bit, Ezekiel reveals that he is also a prisoner and ashamed of his prior lie. They then follow a whimper and find Vicky, victim of a messy amputation and possibly suffused with the Eldritch God's seed in her belly. They have a plan to address this. Just try not to think about it. But just thinking about it causes Paul and Barbara to make a death pact if the same happens to them. So where does that leave her? They're then approached from all sides by many young men. The prisoners attempt to leverage the element of surprise by jumping out and taking on all challengers, including Barbara, who unleashes the power of Ishinru Karate. But these guys are total beefers, and they get their many hands on them. Whether they escaped or not, Vicky's situation would remain pretty much unchanged. So she takes up the knife and denies Dagon's heir as the others are dragged off. They're chained up in a workshop of some sort, and Ezekiel's sassy attitude ensures that he's first up for the festivities. And Paul makes last-minute pleadings and attempts to bribe them, but they're rich in both gold and long life. But only if they satiate Dagon's various appetites. The father then pulls out his ceremonial fillet knife and speaks the incantations. The burly, barrel-chested men hold Ezekiel nice and steady, so he doesn't mess up the father's good work as he slowly separates his face skin from the muscle below. As they inflict a full degloving of his entire head and face, Paul spouts Bible verses, but to no effect. The leather boys then turn their attention to Paul. But the knife barely gets wet before Yushio wheels in and halts the proceedings. She's claimed full ownership of Paul's body and fluids and wishes him to remain unharmed. She attempts to convince him to give himself willingly, but loses his trust when she's unable to make any promises regarding Barbara's safety. You see, they haven't had any travelers pass through for about a year, and Dagon is getting fairly randy. She makes a final remark about fulfilling his destiny, and then leaves him to be bathed and brought to her quarters. <laughs> but these dumb bitches left the knives right out on the counter, so he gets to stabbing. He then grabs a mini keg of kerosene and returns to the church. He finds the steady drone to be coming from the wardrobe, and he follows it into the deepest recesses of the town. Here, Barb is being ceremoniously carved up by her sexual rival. The crowd then chants their approval of the poor treatment of their guest as she's shackled and hoisted above Dagon's dank pit. And they're happy to see that he hasn't forsaken them, but then Paul arrives and ruins everything by burning some of them alive. And you can't live forever when you're on fire. This gives Paul the chance to reverse the wheel, but only very slowly. However, when she emerges, she's still breathing, but has been overcome with madness upon gazing into the eternal maw of the grotesque ocean deity. But no matter, he rips her off and does stuff to her, making Paul be like, dang gone. The mob then descends upon him and forces him to prostrate in the presence of their queen. She peels back his sweatshirt for a view of those washboard abs and the hint of some gill slits ready to manifest. It's confirmed that he is a native Mboken, son to one of the town's sex slaves and a citizen by birthright. Now, with the pieces falling into place, the fishmaster reveals his abominable visage to welcome his son home. I can see the resemblance. As it turns out, Paul and Yushia are half-siblings by father. You are my brother. You will be my lover forever. Bars. Feeling the changes underway, Paul tries to take the easy way out, self-immolation. But damn it if Yushia isn't bound and determined to make a husband out of her sibling, so she tackles him into the cool, refreshing water. Once under, he begins to breathe through his slimy torso. Now that the hard part is over, he decides to roll with it and swims out to live his dreams. Circling back here, the final result was that Paul was one of the half-seafood residents of Mboka. He was apparently the son of Xavier, which I will have questions about in a moment. His mother was like him and the others, a traveler who accidentally stumbled upon the quaint town only to be forced to act as a vessel of sacrifice for Dagon's desires for progeny. It's very subtle, but there are clues to this in the beginning. 
When Paul first wakes up, you can see the hints of gills he has on his ribs. As they discuss being anchored outside Hispaniola, he also references his inability to speak Spanish. He says that his mother fled to the States before he was born and refused to allow him to learn the language. The recurring dreams he had were the gentle callings from his homeland summoning him back to fulfill his destiny. His destiny seemed not to extend beyond reuniting with his sister, maybe Dagon just wants to keep all of his offerings in one place. Ezekiel was one of the last full humans remaining in the village. He claimed to be spared thus far due to the high concentration of alcohol in his blood and his quirkiness. With Dagon siring so many children of the sea, it wasn't totally clear if the other mutated residents were all the result of sacrifices over time, or if it was a combo of that and normal human villagers who became twisted and warped from being under the influence of Dagon's powers for so long. I suspect that to be the case, however. The town didn't like being showy with their wealth, but they had been prosperous with gold and extended life for a very long time. Once all the townsfolk, other than Ezekiel, had either converted or been sacrificed, they began sacrificing anyone who came to town. Dagon's request was a blood sacrifice from the fellas and a son or daughter from the ladies. I'm guessing Barbara's arms getting ripped off was just an unfortunate side effect of her getting pulled out of the water and Dagon feeling a bit jealous about it. I'm sure there are nuances to the mythology that are lost in the movie, similar to other adaptations. I feel like Stuart Gordon usually draws on broader themes, whereas this story specifically revolves around the involvement of an eldritch god. This likely makes it a little harder to get everything in there, but he's still the most successful purveyor of Lovecraftian tales. And the details that were missing for me, the dynamic between Dagon and the townsfolk, Xavier specifically, is confounding. Dagon seeks to procreate as a sacrifice, and in exchange, he grants the town prosperity and longevity. But then Paul and Yushi are described as children of Dagon, but their father is also Xavier? How does that work? I could see way where this would make sense from within a fantasy mythology, but it was never laid out in the film. It's also not clear why Ezekiel lied about the ladies being killed. I think he explained it at some point, but I have no idea what the reason was. Perhaps it was to get Paul to leave, thinking that their fate was sealed? When he mentioned it later, it was a very brief response and I have no idea what he was saying. The only other thing that struck me was the apparent difficulty Gordon had in maintaining his typical frenetic pacing, and Paul making such a big deal out of looking at his phone and then clubbing a guy with it was pretty low impact. He does mention needing to get a bigger phone, but then also does the same thing with the hubcap. There is something missing from these scenes. This is a far cry from the in-your-faceness of Reanimator or From Beyond. But then, what is similar to those classics? Most alternatives will pale in comparison. And really, what we got here was something truly singular. Stuart Gordon took the reins of cosmic horror in the early 80s and made a string of unmatched masterpieces. We have only recently gotten several Lovecraftian adaptations that do the genre some level of justice. But even then, most of what is created resides squarely within the cosmic and or psychological themes. Here we have a very serviceable entry into the wet and moist horrors of the deep ocean, which is one of the most unsettling and absurd biomes available to us. It's here at home, but is as strange as anything you're likely to find out in space, bringing a level of terror that's hard to match. So to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure I'm allowed to decline to recommend a movie from Stuart Gordon, primarily in terms of his horror filmography. Would I recommend Robot Jocks to anyone? Absolutely. But this is about horror specifically, and the man is a legend of the genre. This one was less seen and is less known than his other entries. It's a true modern B-movie in that I don't believe it was released in theaters in the US. And despite its pedigree, it didn't get much follow-up in the home market. It essentially has one out-of-print DVD release from years back and a single Blu-ray release. So if you get a chance to watch it, you should. Now that we're here, I wanted to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.